following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. We are going to talk about specific obstacles that the beginner faces in meditation practice. There are a lot of obstacles to meditation. And in the previous lectures, we explained and pointed out some of the most fundamental ones. Those being not knowing what the consciousness is and not knowing how to work with it. I know we all have ideas about consciousness, but we need to know experientially in the moment what it is and how to use it. The second is energy. Usually we don't have energy because we've wasted energy, we've squandered it, we've invested it into harmful action. We need to learn how to save, accumulate, and transform energy to nourish our spiritual life. And the third, action. We tend to act in ways that contradict our spiritual goals we need to set up the prerequisites for good practice. We need good ethics. We need to know how actions lead to consequences. That if we behave in certain ways, certain consequences always result. And our ignorance of that is a big obstacle for us. So in today's lecture, we're going beyond all of that. We're talking about obstacles related specifically to when we are practicing meditation, either doing our preliminary exercises or going on to the, the actual practice of meditation. So I want to make that clear because I know the title says recognizing obstacles and it could sound very general. It isn't. The first six lectures were about recognizing obstacles too. Today's specific to recognizing obstacles related to practice when you're actually sitting to meditate concentrate in the beginning. We previously explained that the state of meditation is a precise state of consciousness that we access when we learn how to harness concentration and imagination together. The preliminary exercises that a, that a beginner does in order to train is to begin with concentration. In the first six lectures of this course, we have encouraged you to practice daily two things. Mindfulness of one's actions. We call it self-observation. To always be aware of yourself. To be present. To be in the moment. To be aware of your body. To be aware of your heart. To be aware of your mind and to be cognizant of what you're doing at all times, to be here and now. That's the first exercise. That exercise establishes the very beginning of meditation. If you're not doing that, you'll never learn to meditate. The second exercise was to every day develop concentration, to do preliminary concentration practices. And we recommend for that phase of practice, the observation of the sensations of the breath. 
So if you've been following this course and doing those exercises, you should have been doing all that already for 12 or 14 weeks. So now we're going to go to a new phase of work where we're going to leave behind the preliminary exercise and go into something that's more difficult. Concentration, serenity, is a state of consciousness. It is an action of consciousness and it utilizes energy. So you see those factors there? Consciousness, energy, action. We need to be very aware of that trinity. That power of three creates. And it will create accordance to the action itself. So we're learning to concentrate our consciousness and using energy in the right way. The result is serenity. The result is that steadily we begin to advance through these nine stages that we explained in general a few lectures back. That is a cause and effect process. It doesn't happen by beliefs. It doesn't happen by theories. It doesn't happen as a gift from the gods. It happens through work that you do in yourself to change how you use your consciousness and your energy. How you put them into action is what determines your progress through this, these stages of concentration. So in the tradition, we learned that concentration as a state of consciousness has two really important features that we need to be able to identify in our practical experience, specifically in meditation practice. And those two features are a vivid intensity and intense mental clarity. And secondly, stability, one pointedness, the ability to remain focused on something without wavering. So this first feature, vivid intensity, that is visual, that is imagery, that is something perceived. It is not imaginary. This is not just metaphorical. The word clarity and the word vivid imply the ability to perceive something without any obscurity. So in the way that if I ask you to remember what you had for breakfast, the image pops up and you can perceive that even if it's only for an instant. How clear is that image? How vivid is it? That clarity is a reflection of your concentration ability. So if that image is dim and fleeting, and hard to perceive, then you have work to do. Now, all of us have the ability to perceive imagery non-physically. We call it imagination. We call it visualization. You can also call it clairvoyance. It's the same thing. This is simply the ability to perceive images without the physical senses. That's a power of consciousness. It's developed by establishing strong concentration and serenity. When your mind, when your psyche is very calm, this ability to perceive without the physical senses is enhanced. It's much more vibrant. When you have a lot of energy available to that conscious perception, the imagery is even more intense. So if you don't have good concentration and you don't have energy, this seems impossible. So for most people who try to learn to meditate, they can't do this and they give up. They think, oh, it's impossible. I can't do it. Anyone can. It's part of the natural ability of the consciousness. But you have to establish the, the parameters within which it can function. And that is to clear away the initial obstacles that we had mentioned before, work with consciousness, conserve energy, put it into right action, perfect your ethics. I can't underscore that enough. It's through that process that concentration is able to flower and develop properly. So in our exercises, these are the qualities we need to be looking for as we develop concentration. Vivid intensity and stability. 
intense mental clarity and one-pointedness. Now, as a beginner, we won't have these things. You'll also note that if you're observing the sensations of your breath, you cannot develop visualization. That's why at this phase, we drop that practice. We begin now a new practice in which we will harness the power of the consciousness to imagine. We will observe an image. And then we will close our eyes and visualize it. If you look at this picture, study it for a few moments, then close your eyes and try to imagine it. You can see your powers of mental clarity and of one-pointedness. Can you perceive the image in your visualization? And if you can, for how long before you become distracted, before it becomes black, before something else appears? How long can you hold this image in your imagination? Clearly, vividly, stable. That is a measure of your power of concentration and visualization. If you've developed this ability in yourself, you can hold this image for as long as you want. The consciousness has that power naturally and spontaneously. It isn't something supernatural. Why is this important? This skill is what opens the door to real meditation. Remember I explained in the earlier lectures, our goal is prania, which is profound wisdom. We want to have insight into our suffering. We want to understand why we suffer. We want to understand why things are the way they are. The causes are deep in our psyche and they are very difficult to perceive in our current state. But if we harness the powers of the consciousness, concentrate and to visualize, we can access what's called samadhi. And samadhi is the doorway to prana, to wisdom. Samadhi means ecstasy. It's when the consciousness is liberated from all conditioning factors, such as the body, such as pride, such as fear, such as lust. And the consciousness perceives perfectly and it sees what's real. It sees the truth. If you have that power, you can then observe what's causing you to suffer. And instead of responding to it with fear, with regret, with remorse, with pain, with resentment, with pride, you can just observe it as it is. And you can see why. And you can comprehend your karma. And you can understand how to respond, how to change it. That is a tremendous power. That is the power that allows an animal like one of us to become a human being, to become a god, to become a master. It's that power to see the truth and to respond cognizantly, consciously, appropriately. This ability to be able to visualize something and see it clearly and without reaction is the foundation that introduces us into the next level of practice, which is the level we need. So it's a very important skill to have. There are many objects you can use for concentration, but to develop this ability to analyze reality, we need the power of visualization. And that's why for real practice, for real preparation, we need to abandon observing things physical that are outside of us and learn to develop the ability to observe an image, visualizing. It's harder, but the result is orders of magnitude more powerful than the ability to observe your breath. Once you have this ability, you will then be able to meditate on anything and acquire information about it. And that's really what we want to learn to meditate for. The ability to retrieve knowledge for ourselves, not having to rely on anything else but our own abilities. That is a tremendous power. The first two stages 
of those nine we explained previously, they really are closely united with each other. So whenever we learn to practice concentration, as a beginner, we have a completely wild mind. We sit in our posture, we relax, we try to place our attention on the object of concentration, but we're constantly distracted. The mind just refuses to cooperate. Our body refuses to cooperate. We feel pain, we feel discomfort, we feel agitated, we want to leave, we want to get up, we want to drink a water, whatever. Constant battle is the stage one. Settle the psyche. And that's illustrated by this monk who's chasing the animals. The animals represent that quality of mind that's always distracted. Always seeking things. Not settling down. But with some willpower, with study, with learning about the teachings, we can advance to the second stage. And that's why this is called achieved through hearing. Hearing means that we start to really listen to the instructions about how to concentrate. We reflect on it. And during the effort to meditate, as much as we get distracted, we keep reminding ourselves, this is the way it is. Not to get frustrated, not to get discouraged, but to keep remembering the teachings. I have to place my attention again. I have to place my attention again. So it's hearing in yourself the instruction. Doing that repeatedly, making that effort every day to practice, 10 or 20 minutes a day, little by little, as you work with your consciousness all day long, and as you save energy all day long, and you act appropriately all day long, you start to move to stage two, which is settling continually. And that simply means that now when you practice your concentration exercise, you're starting to find that your attention is remaining a little bit longer. And the mind, the heart, start to settle down a little bit. And again, that's the white that we see on the animal's heads. A little bit of settling. Still a lot of effort. Together, these two are called stages of tight focus. You could also say forcible engagement. And that means it takes a lot of effort. A lot of effort to keep putting the attention on the object. The second phase is achieved through reflection. Meaning that you are starting to reflect on that teaching more. You're starting to really digest it. You're starting to reflect on how you see how the concentration is starting to strengthen, the mind is starting to settle, and you're seeing a little benefit. You're starting to reflect on what you're learning. These two stages of development are difficult. They're hard. There's no getting around that. That's just how it is. So go into it knowing it. Go into it prepared. And go into it knowing that this is where you're going to face obstacles. This is where you will be challenged. And most people quit. It's a sad fact that most people give up. Anyone can learn to meditate, but you need to educate yourself about how to do it. And you need willpower to do it properly. If you are able to understand the teachings and to recognize the obstacles, then you can apply the antidotes to them. Here are the main faults that people deal with in these initial phases. There are said to be five. The first is the most prevalent, laziness. Second is to forget the instructions. The third is to not recognize agitation and dullness. And the fourth and fifth are about either under applying or over applying the antidotes to the first three. So this is it. These are the simple obstacles. I'm going to explain them in detail. They're not complicated. If you can recognize them while you're practicing, you can develop your practice and overcome them. These are the only obstacles you'll face. This is it. They're not that difficult. We're actually really lucky. 
If you're able to learn meditation and practice meditation, and these are the only obstacles you have to deal with, you're very lucky. Most people in the world right now don't have this opportunity. There are people with very difficult, painful circumstances who wish they could develop their spiritual lives. They don't have access to the teachings. They live in a place that is not conducive to practice. They may live in places where there's a war or they're being heavily persecuted and have no freedom. So for those of us who are able to listen to these types of studies and put them to practice, we are extremely fortunate. And if we quit, we're foolish. The first fault and the most common is laziness. And this is simply to avoid practicing. And we have all kinds of excuses for it. We justify it. But really, laziness is just that. The first cause of laziness is defeatism. And that's where we tell ourselves, I can't do it. I'm not capable. My mind is too crazy. My karma is too heavy. My circumstances are terrible. We have a lot of excuses. None of them are true. All of them are the ego fighting to preserve itself. Our ego does not want to give up control over our energy and our consciousness. And it uses that type of thought process to disempower the consciousness, to disempower the soul. We as a soul, as a consciousness, need to recognize laziness for what it is, especially defeatism. Defeatism is poison. We should never allow it, even as a joke. Even when we're talking with other people, Oh, I'm not capable. I can't do it. It's very bad. It's infectious. The second cause is attachment to harmful actions. This is also very common. We may know a lot about the teachings. We may love spirituality and Dharma. We may study everything, but we remain addicted to alcohol or drugs or smoking or masturbation or other types of things that are directly contradictory to our spiritual goals. In other words, we have an addiction or an attachment to actions that prevent us from practicing in the right way. We need to look at that specifically in relation with our day-to-day -day lives. If we're having struggles with our meditation, there is a cause. If we're having difficulties, if we're feeling sour about it, we're feeling like it's impossible, the cause is not the practice, the cause is not the teaching, the cause is our psyche, something in our mind. When someone feels negative towards their meditation practice, it's because they're doing something wrong. But when we feel that, we need to identify the cause of that. Most cases, it's defeatism or it's attachment to some harmful action. Sometimes it's lack of will, which is the third cause. All of these can be dealt with in the same way. But the first thing we have to do is to recognize them and immediately apply the right antidote. In general, laziness is overcome by cultivating faith. Now that faith is multifaceted. We don't mean faith as belief. We mean faith in its original meaning, which is confidence through experience. Real faith is having knowledge through experience, confidence, because you've proven that something works. The way we cultivate faith in these teachings is we put them into practice and we see the results. And when you acquire those results, then you know for yourself that it works. You have to reflect on that, become conscious of that and recognize, yeah, I did this and I did that and I got these results and it does work. That builds faith. What happens when you build faith? You build confidence. And when you build confidence, you build diligence. You're willing to work hard because you know it works. This is how you overcome laziness. It's simple. The other thing about overcoming laziness is to contemplate the advantages of serenity or concentration. When you are unwilling to practice your meditation, you need to sit down and Really talk to yourself, talk to your mind and lay out the case. Say, okay, you don't want to meditate? 
Let's see what will happen if we don't. What will be the result if I avoid practicing? And go through that step-by-step step, logically what that will lead to. It's not complicated. And then compare that and show your mind, okay, now if I actually do practice, what will be the result? What would be the advantages of that path? And really show your mind, compare this. Show your mind, teach your mind, teach yourself about it. That is another way to overcome laziness. It's not complicated, it isn't difficult, and it's a simple antidote to apply. But important, whenever you feel that resistance to meditating, deal with it immediately. Don't let it rot because it will get worse. The next obstacle is to forget the instruction. And this is referring to when you're practicing. So you're practicing your concentration exercise and you keep getting distracted. This happens to all of us, especially in the beginning. You place your attention, you're trying to visualize that image, but something keeps distracting you. You need to understand why and understand how to deal with it. Some people just sit that way and sit that way and sit that way and eventually they give up, which makes sense. Why would you keep sitting that way if you're not getting anywhere? So learning to identify this obstacle and conquer it is really important. The antidote is to be mindful. Mindfulness is the ability to be aware of what you're doing. So if you're having trouble in your preliminary concentration practice where you're constantly distracted, which is the way it is in the first two levels, you're always distracted. The antidote to that is super easy. Become mindful all day long in everything you do. Be aware of what you're doing from moment to moment. Concentrate on what you're doing. Don't let yourself be distracted. So when you're driving your car, you just drive your car. Shut off the radio. Shut off the phone. Drive. Pay attention. There's a lot going on in front of you that you need to watch. Not only is it safer to drive that way, you're saving and protecting your own life, but also the lives of others. But you're also developing your meditation skills. When you're at work, just do your job. Don't be distracted. When you're washing dishes, just wash the dishes with full awareness of what you're doing from moment to moment. When you're done washing and you step away to cross the room, watch yourself as you do it. You're concentrating, you're placing your attention on something and you're watching it from moment to moment and never letting it go. That's all mindfulness is. And if you're doing that all day long, you will get through these first levels of meditative stability very rapidly. So mindfulness is the antidote. Self-observation is the antidote to forgetting the instruction. Next, we have excitement. Agitation. And this is when you sit to do your concentration practice, but the mind won't sit still. It's very agitated. Thoughts keep coming in. You keep thinking of other things. Memories keep coming in. Daydreams, imaginary conversations, worries, anxieties, thinking about what you have to do tomorrow, thinking about what you have to do next week thinking about a conversation you had the week before, that constant flow of distractions. That is what we call excitement or agitation. And simply stated, it's an unquiet state of mind. This is the thing that we all want to get past. This is why we come to meditate. We want to get past this unquiet state of mind. We want to experience serenity. So these antidotes are really helpful. To understand excitement though, you need to see what it is, how it functions. That agitated state of mind that's always distracted is a type of craving. It's a type of attachment. It's always seeking outside for things, for sensations. It's always seeking new things, 
pleasurable objects, memories, thoughts, feelings, and sensations. It is the mind seeking out, always going out, looking. Now that out, we, I'm saying that in the sense of it doesn't want to stay where you place it. It always wants something else. That's the monkey on these images on the, the graphic. That monkey is that agitated, distracted aspect of our psyche. Always jumping from here to there. Leaf branch to branch, chasing fruit, chasing tasty things. The problem is that when we let it do that, it creates this unquiet state of mind and it impedes our ability to concentrate. We need to apply the antidote to it. It's very simple. We need introspection. This is to turn our attention inward, to not let the distractions take us away, but instead keep returning inward. And that's all day long we can work on this as well not just in meditation practice, but at all times. The mind's always going to be seeking outwardly. Bring it back to what you're doing during your daily life. When you're practicing and your mind is so crazy it just won't settle down, you can apply this antidote. Stop trying to visualize. Don't force that. If your mind is so crazy and you're just getting frustrated, stop. Don't let yourself get frustrated. That's also poison for your practice. Instead, reflect on those distractions. Reflect on the nature of them. What is it the mind wants? Observe that mind as though it was not yours, as though you were looking at it like a scientist. And reflect on the faults of that distracted state and reflect on impermanence. This can be a very uh, powerful tool for your practice because your mind is always saying, that new show is coming, I can't wait. It's about to come out on TV, I'm so excited, I can't wait. And you see that state of mind that's so agitated and craving and craving and craving that experience. That's an agitated state of mind. You need to be able to observe that and reflect on that with the mind and say, hey, you know, okay, so that show's gonna come out and now watch it and it'll be over. So what? Why get so agitated about it? Why lose awareness of myself and waste so much energy in thinking about that and fantasizing about that, talking about that? It's not important. Or that we get this craving to possess something. We want to buy something. We want to own something. Or we want to get to know a person. We met somebody or we see somebody that we're desperate to attach ourselves to. Again, we reflect on impermanence. Okay, if I get that object or I get that person, then what? I'm not going to be fundamentally different. So I get that car or I get that new computer. So what? I'm still going to be the same person. I'll just have this new thing. I'll be in the same condition psychologically as I was before. Not only that, then I'll have this new possession that I'll be afraid to lose. So I'm still going to suffer. And then one day I will lose it because everything is impermanent. So whether I'm suffering not having it, I'm suffering having it, and I'm suffering losing it, I'm suffering through the whole thing. Why bother with all of that? This cycle that we're constantly repeating because of the attachments of the psyche. You see, the object itself, it doesn't matter whether they have it or not. That doesn't, that's not important. It's our psychological attitude that creates the unsteady mind. It doesn't matter one way or the other spiritually if you're rich or poor. If you have nice clothes or you don't. You can have them. It doesn't matter. What matters is your psychological relationship to them, to things. And that's what this means to reflect on impermanence. And it implies also to reflect on the inevitability of death. Observing how much of our time and energy is spent focused on possessions and external circumstances. And that's why our mind is agitated. 
We're always worried about what our friends think about us, what society thinks, how much money we have, how far we've advanced in our career, but we never stop to think that at any moment we will die and none of that will matter at all. Not at all. We will leave all of that behind. So why bother being so worried about all of that when death is inevitable and we can prepare for it? If we change our state of being, we will experience death in a completely different way. Not afraid, but approach it cognizantly and be able to use it to our advantage. That is a possibility, but not while the mind is unquiet. We need abilities to be able to face death consciously. Excitement and agitation is a severe obstacle towards that. So we need to recognize when the mind is in that state and learn to deal with it in our practice, in our meditation. The next obstacle, of course, is laxity or dullness. Dullness, laxity, means a lack of clarity. Firstly, it deals with when you're trying to visualize the image and you just can't see it. It relates to that. We all have that. Firstly, because the consciousness is weak, it's not trained, it doesn't have any energy. And secondly, because we have a lot of bad habits. Lack of clarity for us seems normal because that's what we deal with all the time, but it isn't normal. But as you develop these skills, you start to experience the way the consciousness should work. Sometimes you'll experience lack of clarity. You'll be trying to do your visualization, your meditation practice, and you feel like you're just trudging through mud. Feel like you can't get anywhere. You're trying to visualize. The mind isn't agitated, but you just can't visualize it. You feel like a cloud is on you. That is a very toxic meditation state, a state of practice. And a lot of people think that is a successful state to reach. Some people go, have that as their goal and they think that is meditation. They're completely wrong. It's a state of dullness. The antidote is to expand your awareness by recalling something that affects you like cold water on your face. Drop your visualization and imagine a bright sun, of extremely bright light, and that will stimulate your consciousness. The other way is you can visualize or imagine or remember or reflect on some astonishing thing, either an experience that you've had spiritually or some truth about spirituality that really astonishes you, such as uh, an experience you may have had with a master or the great compassion of the, the gods. Those techniques work to dispel dullness. Those are the antidotes to the obstacles that you will face as you develop your concentration. So to continue the exercises for this course, the first one is to keep developing self-observation all day and to expand your mindfulness, to lengthen the amount of time that you're able to be mindful of yourself. When you're first learning this, every once in a while you'll remember, oh yeah, I have to be aware of myself, so I'm gonna watch myself. But then a few seconds later, you're distracted again. The goal is when you become aware, become also aware of the continuity of that awareness. You're doing laundry, and you're aware of yourself, but be aware that you need to be aware until you're done. So being aware in the moment, but also being aware that you're going to be moving around, you're going to be changing where you're standing or what you're doing. So developing more continuity. And then do this meditative concentration practice. Instead of observing the sensations of the breath, observe this image that we've provided in the course and visualize it. Just let your mind absorb the image. There's no need to analyze it. There's no need to investigate it, to look into who it is, what it represents, all the symbolism. Forget all that. Just take a mental photograph and then close your eyes and picture that photograph. That's all we're doing with this practice. There is no analysis here. There is no speculation, no beliefs, no symbolism. It's just to take a mental photo and then project it in your mind. 
Then take 10, 15, 20 minutes and visualize that picture. Now let me say about this visualization, do not strain. We already have the ability to visualize. You can prove it right now. What does a monkey look like? Don't you see that picture pop up in your head? What is a banana? You can see the pictures, right? They just pop up. That's it. There's no need to strain yourself. You don't need to roll your eyes around. You don't need any tension. Just let that natural image pop up on its own, spontaneous. And if it goes away, relax and recall the image again. Don't force it. Don't exert it. Don't demand it. Relax. Relax and just recall the image. It will appear on its own, effortlessly. And if it doesn't, it's because the concentration is weak. Your consciousness doesn't have the energy or the strength to hold it. So back off and try again. And keep doing that. Little by little, with persistence and relaxation, one day you'll suddenly realize that that image is just staying there and it's beautiful and it takes no effort. That's the way it should be developing. It will just appear there and be effortless in the same way that you dream. We're utilizing the exact same ability. When you dream, you don't make effort. You just close your eyes, you relax, and then images start. They just happen. We want to use that same exact approach when we develop this power. Relax completely. Call up the image. If it doesn't come, be patient. Just keep trying to project that image in a very relaxed way. The third exercise is to continue with the spiritual diary. Any questions, please ask. So remind me again, what is the purpose of maintaining that image and bringing it up? The purpose of visualizing the image? Imagine that you have the ability at the end of a long, hard day to sit down in your meditation posture, close your eyes and visualize something that happened to you that day that was confusing or painful or difficult. And you, that scene appears in your mind effortlessly and you're able to observe exactly what happened. And as you observe it, some new information appears in the screen of your mind, a memory from your childhood, some other vision that seems familiar, but you're not sure why. And then in your heart, you feel an understanding. These images start to click in place and you start to figure out these relationships between things that you never saw before. That is a simple outline of what we call psychoanalytical meditation, which is the very purpose of meditation. So the power of visualizing leads us to that. To be able to do that, you need these powers that we explained today. You need the ability for your concentration to have a vivid intensity and one pointedness. If you don't, you will call up that image of what happened to you today and your mind will immediately start saying, well, I didn't deserve that. I was right and they were wrong and I this and I that and your mind will just go on and on and on and on justifying itself and you will never get anywhere. What we want is comprehension. We want wisdom. We want understanding and to have that, you need a mind that is stable, settled, and you need attention that can be placed without distraction. It needs the ability to maintain itself no matter what. So when you're observing that event that happened, let's say it's a trauma. Let's say something terrible happened. Do you now have the ability to observe that without reacting emotionally? Probably not. But when you develop this ability, you will. You'll be able to visualize and imagine things that are painful, disturbing, and difficult, but not be distracted by your emotional reactions, by anything, but be able to see the reality of it, the truth of it. And that's what we need to, in order to cut through the illusions. 
the illusions of our mind, the illusions of our heart, the illusions that prevent us from seeing the truth. That's why this is important. We're training our consciousness to have the ability to have insight into reality. What could be more important than that? I'm wondering if um, I could use a simpler image. It's really up to you. The thing is that if you follow the process of the course, the first six lectures were using a preliminary exercise of observing the sensations of the breath. So that's like 12 or 14 weeks of practicing every day, developing the basic concentration. Once you have that, the ability to just observe the breath for a decent period of time, you can start working with this type of image. And it's sophisticated for a reason. Your consciousness has the ability to project incredibly sophisticated detail. And I can give you an easy example. Memory. You don't make any effort to store memories. So if I ask you to remember how you got here, you can remember a lot, right? Where you walked, where you drove, how you, you did everything you did before you came here, but you made no effort to, to store all of that data. This is simple compared to that. This is just a flat field of visual information. But you've got stored in your memory not only the visual, but all the other senses. And it's all there in your memory. This is easy. One picture, like a snapshot with a camera. You take the picture, you close your eyes, it's there. The problem is the mind interferes. The psyche interferes because it's agitated. It's unquiet. It wants distractions. And the main thing is, it does not want to do what you want it to do. That is the main problem. The mind that we have wants to do its own thing. It does not want to bow to our will. If it did, it would be quiet when we want it to be quiet. It would be focused when we want it to be focused, but it doesn't want that. It's fighting against us all the time because we made it that way. It does not have to be that way. With training, that unsettled psyche becomes this white elephant, a willing support and helpful aid in the path. You see, in the, in the beginning, the elephant's out of control and running around. That's that crazy mind that only wants to do its own thing. But when you go through the process of this training, that mind becomes calm, serene, settled here. And then it becomes the loyal friend of your consciousness. Then it will do what you tell it. And it's effortless. At that stage, really in, in, in most of these upper stages, this type of image is so easy. You just take a picture, close your eyes, it's there. Effortless. Because you already have the ability. Just remember any memory that you've got. You did the same thing. You saw it, and that memory is permanently engraved in your psyche. Certain things that you saw, certain things that happened to you, you can never forget. And you made no effort to recall that, right? So I would recommend making the effort to, to try to learn that. I think it's worth it. Well, if you have fear towards the image, I would suggest that you observe and analyze that fear. And secondly, it is totally appropriate to choose an image that corresponds to any religious tradition that you might have. If you're someone that's of a Christian background and you're comfortable with Christianity, then choose an image that's a Christian image. The reality is the image makes no real difference. It's your mind. You're not safe in your own mind. You know, we feel, we go around all the time thinking that we're in this bubble. And that in here, I'm okay and I've, I'm familiar with it. But that bubble is a cage. And we've trapped ourselves in that cage with all of our pride and vanity and fear and lust and greed and 
all those qualities. And we feel safe in it only because we're like a, someone who's been tortured for so long that we've become attached to the torture. We have to break that cage if we really want to change and we want to understand the nature of suffering. That cage is self-imposed and without any need for it. The fear that we have is an ego. Fear does not protect us. Fear cages us. It is not a savior, it is not a protector. It is a type of suffering. To protect your fear by always avoiding things that contradict it is to keep yourself caged in fear. And we need the courage to face that and overcome it. The real protector that we have is the liberated consciousness when it's free of fear. And when, when you experience that, you understand that there is nothing to fear. When the consciousness is liberated, it's experiencing its real nature, it's unbound. It has no fear. So fear is a lie. We should never listen to that. We always have to flip that on itself and see it for what it is. We all feel that. Everybody thinks nowadays, oh, anger is good, you should express your anger, and pride is good. It's, you know, it isn't. <laughs> Those things are wrong. They're why we suffer. Society has it all backwards. And all the great teachers have always said that. Jesus said it, Moses said it, Buddha said it, Krishna said it. All of them agree about this. And we just refuse to hear it because we don't want to deal with the causes of our suffering, which are pride and fear and lust. That is what causes suffering, anger. So it's really important whenever you experience, when you feel fear or you sense pride or you feel anger, not to go along with it. But instead, take yourself out of it and see it for what it is. That's why we study this image of the tree of life. This very low level down here called klipot, that means the world of the shells. And if you think about a shell, it's a very hard surface, but inside is nothing. It's empty. That's what an ego is. Pride is like that. It seems hard, it seems real, it seems solid, like it will help us, but it isn't. It's a cage. And it, kept, it traps the particles of our consciousness that it traumatized. Fear is a cage that traps parts of our consciousness in traumas. And because of the pain that's in there, we don't want to deal with it. We want to avoid it because it hurts. But the only way to be liberated and to rise up to the superior levels of life is to extract all the consciousness that's trapped there in klipot. That is our subconsciousness. All of that. That's in you right now. It's all of that in you that you don't see and don't want to see. If you want liberation, that has to be shattered. It has to be destroyed. And that's what all the myths are about all the ancient mythologies about the hero, Perseus, Theseus, Jason, Odysseus, Lancelot, Orpheus, all of them represent this warrior who has to descend into the underworld to liberate that trapped woman who is the soul, the consciousness, Persephone, Helen, Beatrice. They all represent that aspect of our soul that's trapped in Pluto, in Hades, in hell, by the great dragon, by the demon, by the, the terrible monster, the hydra. That is our ego. So to be free, that has to be killed. It has to die. And when that happens, the liberated consciousness naturally rises. Back up. Persephone goes back. Eurydice is liberated. She goes back. All of those are psychological teaching stories that explain this simple process that meditation is leading us towards. The ability to recognize psychological qualities for what they are and to extract ourselves from them so we can be free of them. Why should we protect fear or pride or anger when they are the causes of our suffering? We don't need to protect them. We need to kill them. Radically, daily. 
In that way, we become completely liberated. No fear, no pride, no lust, no envy. Just the free consciousness, content, brilliant, joyful, peaceful, loving. Like those great masters, Jesus and Buddha and Krishna. How beautiful they are because they have no defects. We have that capacity, but only if we approach it with courage to fight those things. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Glorian Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Thank you.